Ian Punnett, welcome to Cooking with Liz. I'm so excited. Thank <laughs> you for having me. Uh, I was happy to step in after uh, Jeffrey Tubin canceled at the last minute. So <laughs> You're the worst. No, he's the worst. No, he's the worst. Okay. I don't know. I was. What was he cooking? What was that? <laughs> I don't know. I heard beanie weenies or something <laughs> like that. I don't know. I, I only caught part of the story. So See, already we're off track, Ian. That, already. Anyway, let me just remind people that you're watching Cooking with Liz. This is the holiday season, right? Oh. Well, you mean a Toyota thon? <laughs> is it the Toyota thon already? <laughs> sure. Why not? I'll take a Toyota. I sure. I'm mainly just acquiring spices, but anyway, the holiday season, as you know, Ian, I'm doing four weeks and four dishes. So I have an appetizer, a main, and you're my main man. We established that. You're supplying the main. Then we have a side that Liam is teaching me how to do. And then there will be a dessert that, um, that listeners are proposing, but I get to choose. And I, I, I've not picked the dessert yet. So, um, I just have a few last minute questions because you you and I started negotiating hey, from where somebody faxed those into you. Did you get that from my PR person? Yeah. Yes. Believe it or not, I still print things out. <laughs> when you're cooking, I I need to reread the recipe like a hundred times when I'm really cooking. I have never used a recipe. I never use recipe. Okay. Well, that's a gross violation of the cooking with Liz. Eat those. I'm sorry about that. Liz, at least for the first time through try to follow the recipe i that's good that's okay good. and i've never done this before and you you convinced me that i should go for it that it sounds a lot harder than it is right chateau brion is one of those things that's so criminally easy the only reason people don't serve it more often is because it's expensive yes yes but not it's so easy to cook and everybody looks like a genius with very little prep and very little execution skills in the kitchen. Very okay. few execution skills. So, the, you're right, but here's what Liam called it. She said, she said it's a high stakes thing, Ian, because of the cost, not because it's hard. Right. Really well, that's cook. fine. Yeah, but I mean, if you, if you, yeah, I mean, like if you put it in the microwave and hit popcorn, yeah, <laughs> you're gonna, you may not like your results. Darn, that was gonna be my backup plan. My backup yeah. plan. Okay, so I have some questions for you because okay. when we were negotiating about this this summer, um, I couldn't really do it this summer because I was cooking always on the grill. So I explained to you that I needed to wait till I got back home right. to Santa Monica. But now I have, um, so I have the actual recipe. People are very confused even by the word Chateaubriand. I just keep saying it's tenderloin of beef, right? That's all it is. Well, yeah, it's a cut and it's a preparation and it's a guy. Right, so it's the named guy? after, yeah, it's named after Francois Chateaubriand. Chateaubriand. Oh. I mean, that, it was his chef, I think, that made it, but the, the guy was a French aristocrat. I think it's Francois René de Chateaubriand, yeah. Oh, so cool. that's why, that's the origin of it. That's how it became, but it was originally cooked differently is originally harder to prep than the way we do it now. And originally you took that really beautiful cut of meat and then you wrapped it in lesser cuts and you cooked it from the outside with the lesser cuts of, of beef around it. And then that's what made it so juicy and special and whatever inside is because you sort of sacrifice the outside. Um, but I, I like, I don't, I've never had that method. I just heard that's the historic origin of okay. it. It's pretty good. Well, too late for me. I don't care about that. I'm just doing it the exact way it says on this piece of paper. Okay. Good. So when I was texting you the other day, so basically the meat gets sort of seared on all sides and right. then roasted. So yeah. my, my first question to you was searing on all sides. How long does that take? How do I know when it's seared enough? Because my biggest fear is overcooking the meat. Right. So how long does a sear take? So you, how, what, how, what's the poundage? What, 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 well, what is the poundage on this one, Liz? What do we got? <laughs> you know, there were a series of texts on this too. Like how much yeah. do I, basically it's a pound. It's a pound. Okay. So a pound um, will not take long. Okay. So the, 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 the key thing will be when you sear it, it, see, it depends when you put it in the, in the cast iron skillet with the olive oil, 
you want to keep the temperature at just above medium high. Don't want to go all the way high. You want to go above medium high. And then what you're doing is you're essentially browning all sides. You're going to flip it. It would be two to three minutes per side, no more than three. But depending on how the how the cut looks, um, yeah. it may be it may be less than than three. So you uh, plan on two and then flip it. You can always go back and re brown aside yeah. you can't unbrown aside if you go too deep okay right, good point okay according to ian punnett you cannot unbrown aside so it, it would be you'd be having to shave that off you'd have to go find <laughs> some that's going in the cookbook okay now here's a basic question how many sides is this is it just the top and the bottom or are there actual sides well i haven't seen the cut that you have so show me and okay I'm coming. Okay. Hopefully, uh, it's actually one pound thirteen. The piece good. I have here. And what you'll notice is that when you put it flat on the grill, it will take, it will flatten out on one side, and then then you just kind of flip it. Yeah. So you, there's no right. So you got a pretty square cut there. That's good. So just th that'll take care of itself. So just, you know, you'll turn, you'll be basically turning it four times. I don't know what that means. That'll take care of it. Nothing will take care of itself. And it will take care of itself. That means you don't have to stand over it and hold the okay. hold these tongs on it to hold it in place. You should be able to flip it and it looks like it'll be able to stand up on its okay. own. Okay, so, but my question was, it's top and bottom and then the sides. I'm, I'm browning it. Right. Like, okay. Yeah, don't go, yeah, don't go vertical. Don't do, don't, you, know, you don't have to worry about that part. If that's okay. what you're worried about, okay. Good. you're going Good. six sides or something. It's not, don't, you're okay. Right. Okay, I'm making a note of that. Now you mentioned the cast iron pot because this was something you originally told me when we were texting right. on this that you recommended I did not own one. So- You have to pardon me, my hair's getting in my way because I'm going full Kamala Harris. And so- <laughs> It's very nice. Well, thank you. I, you know, as you, as you know, Liz, I've always cut my hair according to the vice presidents. <laughs> it was it was tough when we first got to know each other and I was shaving my head like Dick Cheney for that long. And then the okay. comb over period was a little awkward, but I feel like I'm back on yeah. track here. With I think everyone can get away with anything now during you know the current yeah. unpleasantness. It's just COVID hair, nobody cares. I, I was <laughs> on the fence with Pence. I didn't like that. I didn't like that style. I wasn't, didn't. And okay. to go full in, and I had to call Marjorie mother for all four years, and that was really hard. That's okay, right. stop. We're talking about the cast iron pan. So you told me I was going to, you asked me if I had one. Of course, I did not. So you told me it is recommended. So right. as my... You want to invite me on any show where you really want to be serious for a long period of time. <laughs> I'm the guy, by the way. This is not serious. Always my a good book. My party so, isn't uh, serious either. I'm so, just saying that my, yeah. my listeners and viewers know Skip. that... Cast iron skillet, what it does is it gives you a nice, if it if the pan's too thin, then it burns too hot. So okay. that 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 skillet which you have, which good, 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 good. So that will that that's it's really conductive, it's really nice, it's even, and okay. it looks fits nicely in your kitchen. Okay. And and as a hat, apparently, as you're styling it, it could be a, a fastener. Uh, no, but I, I have the hat hanging over here. I only bring out the hat when I'm actually cooking. Okay. I decided these intro episodes, it was a little pretentious to wear the hat. Okay. But again, my listeners need to know that of course I didn't already own this. So, so you know what I did, what I do, Ian, I get Crate and Barrel on the blower. And uh, so I get Crate and Barrel on the blower and they can't deliver it in time for this weekend's episode. So then I had to go do the contactless pickup at a local crate and barrel. So just so that people, if you're wondering where I got it, of course, oh, here it is. I did the drive-through pickup situation. Never thought my life would come to that, that I'm doing drive-through cast iron pan pickup. In the, in the middle of Kansas, where I sit as we speak, I think the nearest crate and barrel has got to be about 250 <laughs> miles away. So you have options I don't on that. Okay. All right, so, okay, so we talked about the searing. Yes. Then uh, most of the rest of the actual cooking 
of the beef is easy. So now I want to ask you a couple of questions about the sauce, because gotcha. I know the sauce is super easy. You kept telling me how easy the sauce was. Mm -hmm. But then when I read the details of the recipe, which is something I learned earlier in cooking with Liz, that reading the recipe all the way through is, yeah. is critical. You don't work with the recipes, you don't care. But then I noticed that it's there's sort of a sauce in sauce situation here, that I'm not just making a sauce, that I have to have a... Say it. Demi-glace. Say it like a girl from Connecticut, demi-glace. Demi-glace, demi-glace. Um, so and so and as I was reading through this recipe, it's like I had to make the demi glass first, and then I had to use that and put that in the sauce. And if then you I put, didn't already have demi glass, why would I already have demi glass? Seriously. I have, I have, I literally have some demi glass on my shelves right now. Okay, well, too, la enough? too late for me. Too late for me. So I, um, so I started reading the recipe. I thought, oh, I better make that demi glass. That's the whole point is to make it. And then when I read it, it involved like I had to get cheesecloth. I had to get twine. There was like a sachet de piece that I had to create. Yeah, right. there's no no sachet. No, no, no. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you stra the double straining it for the pure yes. consomme no. until you can read. That's yeah. the can you read through it is the question. That's how you know it's thin enough when you can read through it. Oh, okay. Well, none of that is happening here. I, I just all of a sudden, boom, I realized there is a Williams Sonoma two blocks from where I live. So Hooper and I, my sous chef and I walked over there yesterday and sure enough, what's on the shelves there. There you but go. And grass, grass fed, fed on top of that. So thank you. What's that? Grass fed on top of that, right? Yeah, you know, you it's Santa Monica. It's this is the only thing that's allowed. Anything else would be against the law. We uh -huh. raised the cows here in Kansas. However, I'm pretty sure the nearest William Sonoma is like three states away from me. So I, I'm I'm surrounded by plenty of beef, just nothing, nothing to cook it with. Okay, so basically I put this in another sauce that I'm going to be making after I remove the meat from the pan. And that's well, you make it sound more pie. complicated. You're just adding it to thicken it and it will make it even more delicious. And that that because you have a demi glace, that, that will have there's a certain level of salt in it and extra okay. beef, a, a kind of a, a it's a beef, essentially it's a boiled down beef consomme. And so it's very condensed. So you want to you want to blend it in slowly to make sure that you don't overdo it and it doesn't get too salty. Okay. All right. Ooh, consomme. That is a word I have not heard since my parents moved on. They were they were consomme people. Were they? Okay. Yeah. I think not since I consummated uh uh, never mind. Okay. Yes. Yeah, so <laughs> okay. I have one other equipment question. So, so now the, um, the piece of meat is in the oven and it says cook 15, 15 minutes for medium rare. That's me. I'm a yep. medium rare girl. Yep. So I want to make sure. So are you a fan of just going with the time or should I use my meat thermometer? Which well, I actually own and purchased earlier in the cooking with Liz. Ryan. Right, right, right. I mean, I, I don't use a meat thermometer very often unless it's poultry i'm worried about beef i'm less worried about because That's especially right because it. when you take it out you're going to rest it for about 15 minutes you're going to make it like a little tent like yeah. a little pop tent little foil tent you're, yeah, take, yeah. you're taking it camping and and so it will continue to cook during that period and i think you'll be fine without okay. having but if you it, it's always good if you you know if you if you need to be concerned mostly people who are really concerned about it being really too rare or they they need to get it because they can't stand any pink in the middle and you yeah. want to leave it in there oh that's not me no 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 i'm much more concerned with overcooking it than i am undercooking it okay okay so that's good so that's it so i think i can i think i can handle you keep telling me how easy it is that's for you so i want to know i mean you are a really good home cook it's maybe even a home chef draining. I, I told, honey, I think it's Marjorie again. She's got a cough. She's got a fever. I tell her, look, you're among 10 million people. Just get over it. No, I'm kidding. I don't know what the, sorry about the phone in the background. Oh, I that's okay. I, I didn't even hear it. Okay. Yeah. So how did you, how did you learn to be such a good cook? Because you really are good. And now you're posting pictures. Is it in your Instagram that I'm yeah, seeing? I just, do it. I just do it for fun, mostly on Twitter. Uh, I don't, um, so my mother went back to school to get her uh, master's when I was about 10 or 11. Uh -huh. And if I hadn't learned how to cook, none of us would have. 
Um, and so I did it to, to share the yolk. And I also always liked it. Even when I was a little kid, I was considered strange in the neighborhood because I wanted a kitchen playset, which like only girls, you know, did that sort of thing. But I liked it. And I've always, and I was very interested and I had cookbooks from an early age. Maybe that's why I don't use cookbooks now yeah. is I just always noodled. And I find I'd rather have, I'd rather express my creativity that way and have something fail than follow scientifically along you know, it doesn't, okay. it doesn't, well, it doesn't do much for me. You and I are in very different places there. Yeah. I go, by nature, okay, I'm where, by nature, like I'm an that. eyeballer, right? I like that. I that's, like that. that's why all my food was not very good, Ian, because I was just kind of eyeballing things, and I realized nothing ever really tasted great. It just all tasted the same, because I was dumping the same things yeah. on top of the food. So it was Leon and Julie that told me, all this time during the current unpleasantness, this is when I could learn to elevate my skills. Yeah, there you go. Elevate my skills, elevate some of the things I was attempting. Right. So that's what I've been doing since since the end of March. I've been well, slowly taking on things that, not super fancy things that I will only ever make once, but just things that are should be solid pieces of my repertoire in the event that I'm ever allowed to have anyone over again. Right. Or as I always say, if I'm in a POW camp, because I'm the guy you want in there. If somebody's got a shoe oh. and, and there's got, I can make, I can make things out of other things. And I can, oh. Oh. And that's what I kind of enjoy doing was the sort of challenge of that. Although I will say, I, I also elevated my game a little bit during this process, just because I found myself occasionally watching like Chopped or Beat Bobby Flay. And I would look up and I would go, well, I can do that. And yeah. then I would go, yeah, I would go see them do something and I'd be like, well, that's easy. So I just made this really good, um, I've never made cream of asparagus soup. I just made cream of asparagus soup last night just because I felt like it. And I oh. thought, okay, well, if I had this, 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 and this, and then I did, and it was really good. And you liked the result? Yeah, that's it was good. Perfect. And I and I, I think it's uh, it's fun to cook for other people. So I look forward because one of my favorite dinners in California was at that place of yours, Ms. Dolan. Oh, I loved our dinner that night with me and Miss Corny. I know that was fun. And what did I make? Wasn't that just a salmon. roast chicken? It was what? Salmon. It was salmon. I salmon. Believe. Yeah, that was that used to be the only thing I knew how to make. Ian, that was good. That was, it was that really was good. good. And I had I don't cook a lot with I don't cook enough with fish. Um, and so I really liked it. And I actually, that was when I walked away and I went, okay, I can do that. And that was one of the things, but I like sauces too. So I'm very interested in, in French cooking in that way. So I'm always mm -hmm. mastering new sauces. Mm -hmm. So that's okay. why Demi, you know, like doing a Demi glaze, that's easy. You know, that's why you're going to, you're going to find that parts. You'll be, it'll taste so good. You can't believe how easy it is. You'll sweat the shallots. You'll throw in the red wine. It'll be, right. it's, it's divine. Well, you may not know that my slogan is peace and sauce. Can you Love see that? that okay? So okay. that's it. So so I want to learn how to make all these sauces. So do so making the sauce that goes with this sounds good. And then next week, because I'm making, you know, sort of an elevated scalloped potato thing, I'll make a bechamel sauce. I should know how to make a bechamel, right? Yes. Again, one of those things that you would say is super easy, but I've never made one before. But it's it's only until you demystify it. That's the deal. And so you that you're in a position where you you're you're this is kind of the fun part of the discovery is just how easy there's the reason why there's only you know the four mother sauces and all these other things. I mean, there's a reason why this is the first thing you learn. I think I I think I was taught that by my mom. I'm making a, just a basic white sauce was like the yeah. first thing I learned in the kitchen. And I've been expanding on that ever since i'm sure i was taught this by my mother too but i was not paying attention or didn't care it's more that i didn't care okay now we're going to move on though because um here's the thing about you ian you were just a man of so many talents right it, it just it's uh you're a great home chef we've already established that That's you're a long time you're a long time radio host talk show host and there are people in the facebook group that know you from all those years that you and marjorie were on in minnesota yep you're, you're now a professor at kansas state correct you're in the journalism school i'm a professor of practice at the aq miller school of journalism and mass communications at kansas state university as well as the faculty advisor and chief operator of wildcat 919 a new alternative and hip hop music station that um, that we run here on campus. It is the longest continuously running FM college station in the country. And it's here in Manhattan, Kansas. 
Okay. And on top of that, you have a divinity degree. You mm -hmm. are a, you are a deacon in the Episcopal Church, correct? Right. Or some mm -hmm. version of that. Mm -hmm. And most right. recently, you do a lot of things in that world. So you have a brand new book out that is called, hold on here, I'm just going to, got to, now I have all the comments up in the middle of the screen, so I can't. Here, see. I've got a copy of it right here. Okay, great. Nazi <laughs> wives. You stopped. <laughs> they, they were great gals. I, in terms of, who knew? No. Sorry. Okay, no, no. This is what you're really doing. Yes. This is how millennials yes. lead us out of the mess we're in. A Jew, a Muslim, and a Christian share leadership lessons from the life of Moses. Yes. So, so what brought this on? Uh, I well, I've written a couple of books on religion, and I keep writing about religion and media academically. So I've been in a uh -huh. couple of um, you know books that nobody reads, and then it's, but the the Dr. Iqbal Yunus is the one who called me. So he was the Muslim scholar, and he had an idea to do a book about Moses from a Muslim perspective, but he knew that that would be more of a narrow focus. So he wanted to see if I would collaborate with him and write a book about Moses from a, um, a Judeo-Islamic perspective. And I said, well, can't do it without, we had to bring a rabbi into this somehow. And he was totally good at that. So I found a rabbi that um, was through a friend of a friend who had already was an author and had, was interested in leadership in particular. And so that's what we wrote. All three of us collaborated, and um, it's a, it's a, it's really well timed. It's in, we're just getting back to the discussion from the election of how much uh, the impact, how big the impact was of millennials on the current election. On the election, yeah, yeah. And why did you, why did you think millennials needed this type of leadership book? What's so specific? Your kids are millennials, right? Right, they both are, because in a lot of ways, the millennial generation is what we would call the bookstore faithful. Um, they're not really, um, they, I hate the term unchurched, but I mean, they, they are less likely as a generation to part, be regular participants in church, but they're very interested in these subjects too. So we really wanted to write a book which would reacquaint them with a classic narrative with which they're already familiar from like, you know, Prince of Egypt, you know, those. Okay. That's true. Yeah, yeah. Really people, good. Kind of, people kind of know the mythology. Right. And then, and that would be probably a hurtful word for a lot of people. Oh, oh sorry. I, I didn't mean to go okay. I just, uh, I, mean, I meant the stories, the general. I know, I know, I know. The I know. Story has the, yeah, I'm sorry. I know, I know what you meant. So that, but we do address that actually. We do talk about this, the story of Moses, even if one is not a Bible believer, as even if you were just going to look at it as a literary narrative, what, what yeah. it teaches and what Moses's decisions were. And he was very millennial, which is interesting. He's a late bloomer. He, he's really kind of living in his, in his adopt, adopted mom's basement, you know, for a long time. He doesn't find his roots until later in life. And it, it, it some people would associate that with millennials as being sort of a, you know, kind of like the failure to launch generation or the people that were less likely to be aggressively. And he wasn't, he was very comfortable. And then, and then he, he decides when it's time to lead, he leads in a way which millennials would really relate to. He was a very collaborative leader from the very beginning. Even when- yeah, I noticed, yeah, I noticed in the book, you use the phrase servant leadership, which yeah. is something that you hear now at a lot of business conferences, at a lot of training for how to be a leader in a business environment. Servant leadership is kind of the, the latest buzzword. So what is that? Well, servant leadership has roots back about about 15 years and it did start um, in a lot of the uh, Catholic business schools. The focus uh, was on not, is eliminating the, the premise that so many people had of a top down, sort of what we call the command and kind of control leadership style. Which I've been in a few of those, yeah. A very post-World War II kind of, you know, the people at the top are the generals and the lieutenants underneath them and all that other stuff. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. And this was, it's much more about um, leading by serving and becoming, finding out what the needs are for the people that are going to be making the products or are going to be selling the products, finding out 
what it takes to motivate them and to make them perform at their peak. And that's your job is to serve that part. And in return, their increased productivity um, and their engagement um, is what's going to give the company its greatest years of profit. And so servant leadership has been proven uh, even a lot of small companies like Toro is one of the first to do this, where they lowered the amount that the CEO was making or what the officers could make. Right, to, right. To make it more consistent with what the rank and file was making. And so that everybody was invested at a level that had a more of an equilibrium. And, yeah. and that's, what, that's really what we focus on. So looking at this from the three different religious traditions, how different were you from each other? Or were you all, you had the same starting point, so you were more alike than you thought? Right, so what was really interesting, so first of all, I'm the Muslim scholar and the rabbi even kind of look alike a little bit. They have the same beard. Mm -hmm. And I felt like I was the guy in ZZ Top, right? The drummer <laughs> ZZ Top. Well, you were running a hip hop radio station, Ian. Yeah. It's really I, not what people would expect from a re Christian religious scholar. So they were, they have this really cool vibe. They, interestingly enough, they share something which you don't hear about often. The, the Muslim scholar, Dr. Yunus, he grew up in the British part of what is now Pakistan five years before there was a Pakistan. Mm -hmm. And the rabbi grew up in Palestine before there was Israel. So they're both older than the countries yeah. which later on, you know, that they would, they would connect to. Um, and that was fascinating. And so they would often say things when I would be collecting my research, I would send them lots of questions and I would, I would send them an email and I go, how do you feel about this? Or how do you react to this death? What about that? What do you, how do you teach this, the significance of this particular mm -hmm. act? And I had to sometimes double check to see who was saying what, because they said things that so similar. Were similar. Yeah. yeah, that's a good lesson for people. Good yeah. lesson. The biggest fight we had, and we, I mean, the biggest conflict we had, it wasn't a fight, but it took a lot of emails to settle, was whether or not Moses was going, when the whole burning bush thing happens, was he going after a baby lamb or a baby goat? Because they both, the, the traditions were like, get goat or lamb. Mm -hmm. And they would like to go, no, no, it's gotta be a goat. And then the other one's like, no, it's a lamb. And it'd be like, okay. Can we just say goat and lamb and or, so I finally had to write a little sidebar explaining the, the goat lamb controversy, but that was about it. That was about, that was about as bad as it got. That's so great. So, so thinking about this book, I'm just noticing in our comments, um, Natalie said, my brother-in-law was a comparative religion major thinking this might be a good holiday gift for him. And so who do you think this should people, who is this book good for? Like who? Well, should should our listeners buy it for their millennial kids? Should it, who's it for? Yeah, I think there's a I think especially anybody who's interested in leadership, I think anybody who's interested in in, in seeing how synthesized these traditions really are, and the beautiful yeah, part of it is really just how much we have in common as opposed to how much we differ on. Which is, if we can agree on this Moses narrative, um, and and a lot of people don't know a lot about Islam, so it's a great introduction to how Islam. You know, tells the the story. What what does it say in the Quran? Um, about, and Moses is a huge figure in the Quran. So it it you know that and so is Jesus. A lot of people don't know that, but Jesus is spoken right, of right. nearly as much of as 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 Moses. And I think that's where, I think that's a good demographic. I do think millennials would appreciate it, especially people who may be getting millennials who are getting into the business world and they're looking for some new models because we, we do is that Marjorie again tell her it's just a cough and a fever it's gonna pass okay all right I don't know <laughs> okay so so and is there any particular place people should buy it or is just everywhere? We've been sending people to bookshop.org because right. they support indie bookstores. Right. But what would you recommend? Well, if it's in indie books or so, it, it sold out of Amazon two or three times. We were number one on the readership. We were we were number one on new uh, leadership books. Wow! Uh, Congrats! Yeah, yeah twice, twice. Like so, the hardcover and the Kindle were like one in three. I felt like the Beatles. It was really cool. It was like, really cool. <laughs> and then um, and then we fell off, and then we came back again. Um, yeah. And so, but I think they sold out of books. Um, 
I think Barnes and Noble had some.com and then I tar it's in targets. Target oh, okay. All right. That's great. Target All right. Book. So but people it's not can, exactly the friendly little neighborhood bookstore. So I, I like what you're suggesting there too. I like that. Better. People can just Google around and find it. We recommend it. There's one other comment here. Marcia's saying, I'm going to look for your podcast. Hope you have one. Well, you don't have a you don't have a podcast right now, right? But your wife Marjorie has a fantastic podcast, right? Well, great. And she models it a lot of her success after you all. Um oh. honestly, it's true. And and so she loves to listen to the Satellite Sisters, and and I do too. In fact, I'm the one that was like, I I would bring her up to date on what you all were doing, and she's like, oh, I gotta remember to listen to that podcast. And then she started listening regularly, and then like now it, she'll listen, she'll get all caught up like four episodes at a time. That's she, great. That, yeah, that's a good way to do it. And the name of her podcast is Best to the Nest. I don't know. Yeah, Best to the Nest. Yeah. <laughs> no, Best to the Nest, and it is a um, she does it with a woman who she worked with after you and I were both kicked out. Yeah. Um, and so um, she uh, she does it with a woman that is uh, in, in the Twin Cities and she has little kids. And Marjorie, obviously, you know, our boys are 29 and 27 now. Yeah. And that the idea has always been that it was something that we premised our relationship on, which is that, you know, it's one, it's really hard to bring your best self home. Yes. And that's really what it comes down to is how, what are the ways that we can do that where we're not just leaving our best work at the office and then we're coming home and we're taking it out on the people we love. Yeah. So that, that's the, the weekly podcast is yeah. all focused on bringing your best back to the nest. I was especially enjoying it the last month because you were filling in for her partner who just had a baby, right? Yes. Her yes. In fact, Marjorie won an Emmy and she had, uh, Elizabeth had a, uh, baby at the same time and I I I think I think that's exact every time that that she has a baby Marjorie has to win another Emmy or vice versa I think that's a good I think because I like being on so I like you know I probably probably another couple of years before I get to sit in again but that was fun. a family that does so many things well okay I just have one last question for you um as my coach as my Chateaubriand coach there's a there's a gift coming your way oh, um you. I'm thinking apron. So you, your choice. Okay. So this is the, I, I like that's that. the I'm an eyeballer. Okay. Right. I'm right. an eyeballer. So there's that one. There's my theme. Oh, pizza. I gotta go with the Liz theme. I got to go totally with that. So we have peace and sauce because your third choice would be, I don't have one here, but we also have satellite mister. This is obviously a t-shirt, but we have satellite mister aprons. Which would you like? I, I, you know, I have to feel, I feel a connection, you know, to Satellite Mister. I feel like you were, you were nice you enough a long time. to be on the show. Uh, yeah, so I would take, if you had that as an apron, I would take that as an apron. Okay, an apron. all right, you're on. Uh, so, so we're done now. You're yeah. going to get to see, I'm going to do a lot of the cooking on Saturday, and then I'm going to finish it up on Sunday. And I think we might check in again on the Sunday show <laughs> so you can tell me how I did. Okay. I you will love what you cook, and the next time you have people coming over, this you'll be like, ah, how about a little Chateaubriand? And you'll, it'll be the easiest thing for you to whip off, and you'll be so glad you did. Okay. All I right. wish I were only there to eat it with you. I know. I wish. I'm just gonna hold it up to the camera though, and you're gonna just take I, a big oh. whiff as best you can. Of course, That's we all cool. wish we could all be together more, but. Not you know, right I love the fact that we text as much as we do, and I love listening to you and whoever sister is available, and so say <laughs> hi to all of them for me. I hope and, you and I really do. I just I hope that um, uh, I, I I hope this was helpful for you, and I I hope that in the end you'll feel like this was all worth all the trouble and the expense. You know, for me, it's mainly about the confidence, and you've given me the confidence, so that's what I need. I think I can elevate my game. We'll You're see. Gonna kill it. You're it'll be it'll be here for everyone to see whether I elevate or not. So yeah, very you, good. You'll be the judge. Okay. Thank All you. Right. Peace and sauce. Bye bye. <laughs>